Welcome to the Word of Life Center podcast. It's our desire that today's message would equip and empower you to see the Word of God bring life to your life. What I want to talk to you about today is Jesus' ministry to you. And sometimes if we're not careful, we can get real religious. You, you know, you, you don't have to be spiritual to be religious. Did you know that? A lot of people think that being religious is spiritual and they're mistaken. And the f- main way you know that is when you cut them off in traffic. And you'll find out there ain't nothing spiritual about them. You heard what the words came out of their mouth. Had nothing to do with spiritual things. But yet they'll be in church being religious. You can repent now if that's you. That's okay. You know. <laughs> but I think sometimes we don't, we don't really realize the value and the impact of what Jesus really wants to do for you. And in your life, and, and sometimes I think we get caught up in, well, you don't understand, well, you don't know, well, this, well, that. And, and, and really, if you, if you just stop and look at Jesus' life in his ministry, you'll find out that there's not much he won't work with you on. I mean, it's so rare that it's not even worth bringing up. And here's the thing that you've got to understand, and this is so important that you hear me today with this. Listen. Listen. Jesus defined what he would do for you when he walked on the earth. Okay? It's not different. The reason I'm saying that is that what Jesus did when he was on the earth, he was the word. What we read today about Jesus is the word of God. And nothing has changed about our relationship other than that he's in heaven at a much more advantageous place, sitting at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for you. So you need to understand that Jesus defined his ministry by what he did when he was walking on the earth. Okay, If you'll get that revelation and, and realize that that wasn't just Jesus over here, and now Jesus is over here. Okay, It's literally... Jesus defining who he was going to be to you. All the death and resurrection did was solidify and guarantee that performance for every generation that followed. You want to know what Jesus will do in your life? Jesus demonstrated it for us while he walked on the earth. So, to be honest with you, there, now look, I understand there are special things Jesus did for a person. But bottom line, most 99% of what Jesus did on, when he was on the earth, he'll do for you. Okay? Now, the good news is, you don't want to be that 1%. That was Judas. You know, the Bible says he went out and hanged himself. So, you know, don't, don't, don't go there. My point is... And I want you to focus on this today and listen to me today because Jesus demonstrated what he would do for you when he was on the earth. All right? Now, let me show you this from the Word today. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it down for you, but let me just put it to you this way. Well, let me stop here and just say something to you before I do this, just so I can, you, you can be clear about this. Sometimes, especially if you've been in church for a long time, and I've had to really watch myself because I can be guilty of this. Whoever's speaking, in this case me, will read a scripture and you say, you know, I've read that before. Well, so what? Well, I've heard that before. I've heard, I, I, I know about that. Well, wait a minute. Maybe you don't know all there is to know. Maybe there's something new that the Lord wants to refresh in you today. Listen, I had this happen to me many years ago, um, many, many years ago. I was really pretty new in the Lord. I, I, was, I would always, in Matthew and, and Mark, especially, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, well, really Matthew and Luke, I would skip the begats. Any of you ever read the Bible? You know what the begats are, you know. 
so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so. And finally, you get down, all right, come on, give me something here. Let me read some word here. And, and so I, I used to do that. I just would flat skip it. One day, I'm sitting down reading my Bible, and as usual, I skip the begats. And the Lord spoke to me so clearly in my heart. Listen, he spoke so clearly in my heart. And he said, there's very important information there you need to read. Why are you skipping that part of my word? Well, you know, when, if you, you hear that, you better go read. So I started reading the begats. You know, and at first I started reading them and I got the same old, same old. Yeah, uh, so and so. Yeah, I got. But then all of a sudden God opened my eyes and I began to see the faithfulness of God from one generation to another. And how throughout history, he hadn't lost one generation. He hadn't lost one person. He knows exactly who begat who, when it happened, and when the next one's coming. And he kept up with it. And, you know, all of a sudden I got a revelation that I'm in those begats. Somewhere down the line, if you keep on reading, you're going to read Sam Carr's name in those begats. Yours too. And it, and it gave me an overwhelming sense of God's faithfulness to every generation. How he never fails any generation. Some people say, well, you know, this next generation, they're a lost generation. No, they're not. No, God's faithful to them. I know I'm getting away from what I'm preaching. But just so you understand, don't get caught up in that. Okay? Now, I'm going to set this up for you. Then we're going to go to a scripture. Jesus... Most people say turned 30 years old. When he turned 30, he walked up to John the Baptist, who was baptizing people in the river. And basically, he says this, you baptize me. And John the Baptist said, no way, Jesus. No, I, I'm not worthy. And Jesus said, yeah, yeah, you need to baptize me. So John the Baptist, his cousin baptized Jesus. When Jesus came up out of the water, visibly, listen to this, visibly the Holy Spirit came down on him. Listen to me. Visibly came down on him and he was filled with that with the Holy Spirit. At that moment in time, Jesus began his earthly ministry. He'd been on the earth 30 years. Not one miracle. Not, not anything. Nothing. Just nothing. Just Jesus being a good boy. Get, being a good man. But all of a sudden he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately. Now listen to me. Immediately. He went into the wilderness. To be tempted of the devil. How many of you recognize that sometimes God will do something great in your life and then the next minute all hell breaks loose. Well, you've never had the hell break loose in your life Jesus had in his. You understand what I'm saying? So he's in the wilderness 40 days, hadn't eaten, hadn't drank nothing, 40 days. So the devil comes after that 40 days and tempts him. And I'm not going to go into the temptations, but let me just tell you this. It's the same temptations that the devil brought before Adam and Eve. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and pride of life. Jesus had to deal with those same three things. Guess what? You have to deal with those same three things. But Jesus conquered them by not allowing the devil in any way... To get into his life. He just spoke the word to him. Finally after he'd, he'd done that the third time. It says the devil left him for a better season. A better time. I like it when the devil leaves for a while. Amen. And, and listen that, that happens. Sometimes you have to resist the devil. You stand. And when you do. I'm going to tell you. God can do great things. So. Now you understand, this is Jesus. So Jesus comes back out of the wilderness, and the Bible says he comes out in great power, starts preaching. Then he comes to his own hometown. 
Now, I'm going to use the reference this way so you'll understand this, okay? It's not, not exact, because, but, but you, you can understand it this way. Jesus walks in the church that he was raised in. Been in church his whole life. Sat at the feet of the, of the, of the, the rulers of the synagogue, those who were in charge. Listened to the word, asked questions, was part of the church. But this time when he comes in, back in those days they didn't have Bibles, they just had scrolls, okay, that had the different, what we call books of the Bible written on them, they actually didn't even have numbers on them. So, but for reference, we'll say it this way, Jesus walks in and says, give me the Bible, give it to me. In this case, he said, give me the, give me the book of Isaiah. Jesus takes that scroll And he rolls that thing out to the very end, Isaiah 61. Okay? And now listen to what it says in in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. We have it. And I want you to listen to what he said. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty, y'all still here? To proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I love what it says in the next verse. He closed the book and gave it back to him and sat down. And it says everybody was looking at him. Everybody was staring at him. There was a reason everybody was staring at him. Because those verses that he read, listen to me, those verses were separated, segregated for the Messiah. For the, for the Messiah to come and bring deliverance. And he was saying, I am that person that's why they were staring at him jesus outlined his ministry to you now he did lots of things but this is an outline for you and i to understand what he will do for you it was his beginning his his proclamation, his declaration of who he was and what he would do. And just because he's in heaven, this has not changed. It's still real today. It's still active today. And you have to understand something, that that anointing that he said he had was what he had when the Holy Spirit descended upon him. And that same Holy Spirit has now been sent back to us so we can receive that same anointing. You have to fight for that. I have to fight for that. But if we do, we can see this happen in our lives. So listen to what he said. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me to do what? Preach the gospel to the poor. Now, I want you to listen to me today, and I want you to hear this. If you will understand what he was saying there, you will find out that he was saying, your poverty does not define who you are with God. Your money or lack thereof has nothing to do now with your relationship with the Father. It doesn't matter how much you have or how little you have. We all have equal access to the Father through Jesus, and that's good news. That's good news that we know and we can have that in our lives. It gives everyone the same place at the table with Jesus. Now, I know, and I'm not trying to be critical of this at all, 
But I know people who say, well, you know, Jesus preached to the poor that they don't have to be poor no more. Well, that's not true. Because you can't find that in the Bible where Jesus preached that ever. In fact, he, he made a statement totally contrary to that. He said, the poor you'll have with you always. But it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter your station in life. You have the same access to everything Jesus did as any other person who has ever made Jesus the Lord of their life. You have it. Now, granted, you can learn from Jesus how to prosper. You can access the Father's grace in your life by faith and be blessed. Absolutely. But it doesn't matter whether you've got a nickel in your pocket or a million dollars in your pocket. Listen to me. It doesn't matter with Jesus. Especially in America, we put way too much emphasis on that and that we judge people's spirituality by what they have. I'm just telling you, that's just not a way. You can't do that. Well, you know, I'm driving a pickup truck and they're driving a Cadillac. Well, so what? Let me tell you something. If you were in, on the roads in Africa that I've been on, or in the roads of, of, of South America that I've been on, or Central America, you'd rather have the pickup than the Cadillac. Trust me, you would. And in some cases, you would rather have a donkey or a mule to be on than anything that was powered by gasoline or diesel. So you have to be very careful about that. In fact, Paul warned Timothy to tell people, don't ever think that godliness is measured by what you have. Because it's just not true. Well, you know, I could have been rich, but I made bad decisions. It doesn't affect Jesus. He's not looking down and saying, well, you know what? If you'd have just made a better decision, you'd have had more money, and I'd have liked you a lot better. <laughs> I'm just telling you, you've got to understand something today. Don't ever let the enemy tell you that you can see somebody and they're prospering and they're praising God for it, that they're better than you or in a better position to talk to Jesus than you or a better position for God to work in their life than you are right where you are. Thank God he'll bless us. Thank God he can, he'll, you know, you can get a hold of the word of God and God will do awesome things in your life. He's blessed me. Listen, when I got saved, I didn't have anything, nothing. I had zero. God has blessed me, but that doesn't make me spiritual. So you have to understand that. Don't ever let anybody, don't ever let the devil tell you or anybody tell you, well, you know, you're not as spiritual as I am because I got more than you do. I got it from Jesus. You're not using your faith. Maybe not, but I can still talk to Jesus. Maybe not, I can still go into the presence of the Father just like you can anytime. Jesus said, I've got good news for you. Your financial situation has nothing to do with your relationship with the Father. In fact, I would dare to say if you're poor, you're better off. Huh? Huh? Because the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. So, you know, you're kind of slipping under the radar there. Thank God I don't have anything, you know. I don't have to be responsible when I get to heaven for what I don't have. <laughs> yeah, you might want to go read that sometime. But listen, as far as, as, as your relationship with Jesus your poverty does not define who you are with God. Don't ever think that it does. Don't ever look at somebody and they got on a nice dress or a nice suit and you're coming in blue jeans and a t-shirt and you say, oh, they must be spiritual. No, it may not be that way at all. I'm, I'm going to just stop here and tell you something. I, I didn't talk about this in the first service. Most of the time, people who really love God and have money, you would never know they had any money. 
I was, I was preaching in California years, many, many years ago at a church. And the Spirit of God was moving and the pastor of the church was ministering to people. And I, and I was just sitting, I'd already preached and already ministered to people, but he was ministering to some other people and had some people come down the front, didn't know anybody in the church. And I'm, I'm standing there and I saw this one man, he was in there and he had on tennis shoes and an old pair of blue jeans and a t-shirt on. And, and I, I didn't know him, I didn't know him. And I walked to, up to him. And I said, listen, you're just going to have to obey God tonight and do what God told you to do and quit resisting. He threw up his hands and said, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. Well, what I didn't know was that the church was, had a balloon note on their mortgage due the next day for $350,000. Now listen to me. For $350,000 and didn't have the money. They are going to lose their building. And this man the next day walked in he was a multimillionaire. Wrote a check for three hundred fifty thousand. I held it. I said, "You're no respecter of persons, God. You do this for him. You do it for me." That man, you would have never known he had a penny. Godliness does not relate to prosperity. Jesus defined that. And again, I'm just going to say it again. Don't misunderstand me. God wants to bless you, and he will. But don't you ever think you're less spiritual because you have less than somebody else. Just doesn't work that way. Jesus said it. That I didn't. All right? So listen to what else it says here in this this verse. He said this. He said, "He, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now stop and think about all of the things that... Jesus could have said about his primary ministry. All of the things that could, he could have declared or spoken about. And right in the midst of it, he says, I came to heal the brokenhearted. That tells me there are a lot of brokenhearted people in the world who have had their hearts broken over something the 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 bible here the word actually says somebody who is broken down somebody is crushed someone who has been shattered and lost their strength that's called that's a broken-hearted person i don't know whether you have but i've been broken-hearted over stuff in my life you know the greatest heartbreak to me is people who used to come to church and don't serve God anymore. Used to come to this church, and now they don't even serve God. That breaks my heart, okay? It hurts, but listen to me. I get over it. Don't get upset with me, but I get over it because I am not going to live a brokenhearted life. I know way too many people who live their whole lives defined by one action that broke their heart. And they never get over it. And everything they do from that point forward is determined by that heartbreak. Linda Cooper broke my heart when I was 17 years old. (laughs) But I got over it. Hope she never watches this, but... She knows she did. She knows what she did. (laughs) But the point is, listen to me. Most people in life have been shattered before. Most people have been hurt before. Most people have been wounded before. And they, and they literally allow that broken hardness, that shattered feeling, to, to live with them the rest of their lives. I know men who wouldn't dare get married again after what that woman did to them. I know women who said, I don't ever, I ain't never trusting another man as long as I live. I tell you, he did, he broke my heart. Listen to me a minute. Jesus came to heal your broken heart. It doesn't matter what, what that is, how big it is, how big a problem you think it is. It is nothing compared to the anointing 
of Jesus to come and to lift you out of that and to heal your broken heart. The more, I, the more I'm around people, I find that their destinies literally are determined by a broken heart rather than the will of God. My, listen, my heart's been broken many times over things. But you get over it. Things hurt. You get over it. I just got a phone call this uh, past week when I was in Colorado from, um, of a, uh, from a woman that I've known for many years. Her, her dad and I were friends for many years before he we went to heaven. And she called me. She said, Pastor Sam, I need to talk to you, man. And I said, well, what's going on? My husband left me. And uh, he left me and my daughter, said he didn't love me anymore, didn't, wasn't sure he ever loved me. Left me and my, and the, my nine-year-old daughter. And, um, and come to find out, he'd already been seeing another woman. Left us in debt. Let, I mean, you name it, he did it. Left us in debt, did things we didn't know about, and, and, and had borrowed money from friends that were her friends that he did, she didn't realize. And, and, and uh, I said, well, bless your heart. I said, how are you doing? What can I do to help you? She says, you know what, Pastor? And I, I, I tell you, just bless me. She said, I'm going on. I know Jesus. I know he's my savior. I know he'll provide for me and my daughter. And we're not going to let this decide how we're going to live our lives. We're just going to keep on going. And we're going to see God do something. And I was so proud of her. She said, God will provide. God's going to open the door. I, 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 I said, amen. I mean, I got to let her preach. I mean, it was, but, but it was such a blessing because she could have let that. And it, it was fresh. It was you know, this wasn't something that happened a year ago. This had just happened. But yet she'd already determined in her heart, I am not going to let this define the rest of my life. Because she was, she's in her 40s. She said, I'm, I'm 40, I think born at 42. She said, I, I may be 40, 41 years old, but I'm, God's got more for me. I'm just going to go far. I'm not going to let this control my life. And it's amazing when you make up your mind to do that. Okay? Because Jesus came to heal Your broken heart. Now listen to me a minute about this. So this is very important. Listen. That doesn't mean you don't have scars. I I, I preached a message about this, similar to this, about wounds many years ago. And I got to talking about my scars. I started with my feet. I had surgery. I broke this foot. Then I went up my leg, and I broke this leg, and then I, and I could add to it now after that message. I've got both my knees replaced. I got a hernia scar here. God, where they took my kidney out, I got a scar here. I got scars on my shoulder where they did my rotator cuff. I know you want me to stop, and I am. But that's about half of it. But, but here's the point. Okay, now listen to You've got to hear what I'm about to say. Listen to this. None of those scars hurt. I know they're there. I know what they represent. You want me to show you? Let me show No. I know what they represent, but they don't hurt anymore because I don't look at them in the mirror and say, oh, my God. Look at that scar on your belly. Oh, it's so bad. And this looks the memory of what happened. And oh, you know what? I look at it and say, yep, I got a scar. Listen, the thing you've got to understand is God's not going to erase the memory of an event. That's what scars are. They are a memory of an event. Okay? In my body, that's, those are events. They happened. But I'm not defined by that. I'm not defined by those scars. I'm defined by what I've done since I had that scar. So quit looking at your scars and reopening the wounds and making them fresh every day. I got to tell you something. I had my knees replaced. I, won't, I would not want to open that up again. I am glad I am over that. But some people seem to allow those wounds to stay open in their lives and just, just fester and gets worse and just starts defining their lives. I want to tell you something. It doesn't have to be that way because Jesus said the second thing that he came to do, would you like to hear it again? Listen to this. The second thing he came to do was he came to heal 
the broken hearted. So you've got, you have a Savior who wants to heal your heart. He has come for that purpose in your life. And let me just tell you, the word heal here is a very strong word. It means to cure, heal, and to make whole. Well, I'll never be the same. Good. How about better? How about better instead of never the same? Because you're not defined by that. I'm talking to somebody today. That's why I'm still walking around on this a little bit. Because you, you've, got to get, you've got to get over it. You've got to go forward. You've got to let Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, who was anointed to do it. Listen, let me put it to you this way. If I'm having heart trouble, I don't go to a urologist. Because <laughs> I don't want him trying to fix my heart because he's going to go at it from the wrong direction. Boy, that came out of left field right there. But, <laughs> but do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Jesus is very capable of healing your heart. You can go to a psychiatrist till you're blue in the face. You can talk it out a hundred times. But until that anointing that comes from Jesus comes on you, you're not going to be healed. Thank God he heals a broken hearted. He'll make you whole. It doesn't matter how many scars you've got. I'm whole today even though I've got scars. Well, I lost my leg. Then jump on one leg. You can't let it define who you are. Here's another one that's pretty strong. Okay? Now, now you got to follow me here because... I know I'm talking to some of you. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Send me to heal the broken heart. Now listen to this. Proclaim liberty to the captives. Proclaim liberty to the captives. Now listen to me a minute. The word captive there, really, if you study it out, it goes back to being a prisoner. It actually goes further than that, and it means a prisoner of war. Do you know that if you are a Christian, you're at war? Not with your neighbor. You're at war with an enemy. Okay. Do you understand that? You know, we, we don't war against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of dark, darkness and wicked spirits in high places. There is a war going on. Okay. But the problem is that half of the body of Christ is in jail. They're in a, or they're in a prison camp. See, here's the thing that you've got to understand, okay? When I, I, this, this really just kind of came to me. If you're in a big prison camp, you can have fellowship with the prisoners. And that's the way a lot of people in the body of Christ are. They're in a prison camp. They don't even realize it because everybody else is in the same place they are. And they think they're free. And they're in the prison camp fellowshipping with other prisoners. And the whole time, Jesus is saying, I have come to set the captive free. But it's sad because most people, they like to identify with people just like they are. And there's nothing wrong with it. Just don't be bound up the same way somebody else is. Let me give you a picture of this over in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And this will help you understand what I'm saying today. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 25. In fact, I I don't like to read this portion of scripture because I get convicted every time I do. Verse 24, it says, The servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient. In humility, verse 25, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. Now listen to this carefully. That they may come to their senses 
and escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. He's talking to a pastor, talking to the sheep. A snare, I, I used to do that, play with snares when I was a kid. And what we would do, we'd just get a little basket and make something out of a little basket. We'd put a stick and then we'd put some, something on the inside of it. And so when those animals would go to get what was inside, they'd trip that snare and they'd be caught. And that's really exactly what that word means. It can be used a lot of different ways, but, but bottom line, that's what, it, that's what it's meant to do. Now listen to me. The enemy will put out a snare. Could be drugs. Could be pornography. Could be lots of different things. I don't want to name, try to start naming because you'll think I'm missing you and you're okay. <laughs> but listen to me. So there's a snare. Okay. Doesn't mean you're not a Christian. Doesn't mean you don't love God, but you've gotten caught. You've gotten snared. You've gotten caught up with, and look, it could be, it could be lots of things. Okay. But, but let's just talk about one. It could be pornography. Okay. Because there, there are a lot of men and really, literally there are women who are addicted to pornography who are Christians. What, how does that happen? It's got to start somewhere. Yeah. You know, you don't just decide one day, I think I'm going to be, I think I'm just going to be uh, hooked on pornography. I think I just, I'm just going to do it. No. What happens? Somewhere there's an image. Somewhere there's something and you literally step into or you reach your hand into or you try to grasp it thinking, I'll just do this one time. I just want to check. I know people that have literally gone into alcoholism. Listen to me. Because they thought they were doing the good by going with somebody to a bar and they just had a drink with them. Had a couple of drinks. Next thing you know, they're going back. Next thing you know, they don't care whether anybody's with them or not. What's happened? You snared. Doesn't mean Jesus doesn't lo- love you. Doesn't mean he won't work in your life. But you get caught. Yeah. And listen, something like uh, pornography, that is an addiction that will bind you down. And here's what happens. You end up being in a prisoner of war camp. You're not free to be who you really are. See, listen, I'm an American, but if I was at war and I was put in a prison camp, I'm still an American, but I'm not free to do what an American can do. Same thing with the body of Christ. You get bound up, and the minute you you start going in a direction to be free, listen to me, you think, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. All right, so you go, and all of a sudden, there it is again. You find that fence. You can't go past that fence. Jesus said, I've got good news for you. I'm going to set you free. I have the capacity, I have the ability to break that yoke off of your life. It doesn't mean he doesn't love you. Listen, if he, if he didn't love you, why would he even want to set you free? Yeah. Well, are you sorry, so-and-so? You got into this. You got into that. I don't love you anymore. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Jesus will never do that. Well, I got caught, and, but I got free, and then I got back into it again. You know what he'll do? He'll help you again. Now, I like what it says here. It, it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 26, it says that they may come to their senses. You always want to let people know Jesus will set you free. Because at some point, people will come to their senses. Not everybody, but some people. And when they do, guess what? Jesus is there. He's ready. My dad did that. Okay, My dad was an alcoholic. Okay, I think he started drinking like when he was 12 years old. And he was, he was a full-blown alcoholic as far back as I can remember as his son. Just, just literally drank himself into not being able to accomplish anything in life other than I was born. Well, I guess my brother would say it was me and him. But anyway, but, but the point is, 
60, 60 years, almost 60 years, he drank. Not 60, 50 years he drank. One day I go over to his little house he lived in, and he's sitting on the couch. And he said, now listen, i got to quit drinking. What happened? He came to his senses. Now, I'd been, I'd been talking to him about the Lord. I'd been praying for him. But he came to his senses. And when he did, God supernaturally delivered him. Don't ever think that you're a lost cause, that there's no way, no hope. Because I want to tell you something. Jesus specifically came anointed to set you free. Say, so, well, pastor, pray for me. Jesus is the one who set you free. I mean, I, I don't mind praying for you, but I'm going to tell you something. It's better if you just call out to the Lord for yourself and let him do it, because then you'll know no man had anything to do with it. Then the Bible goes on to tell us that this in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. He said, I have come to bring recovery of sight to the blind. Now listen to me a minute. I know that Jesus healed a lot of blind people. He still heals blind people. I remember as a young, as a young Christian going to a crusade in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and I sat there and I watched a young woman who had been blind from birth, her eyes totally open and she could see. That image is forever with me. I know that happens. Why it doesn't happen more? Don't have the answer to that. But I want to tell you something. He still does it. But listen to me. I also believe that he can open the eyes of those who are blinded by something. I believe that he can bring revelation. He can bring illumination to you where before you couldn't see. It's like the, uh, when the blind man was healed over in John chapter 9, verse 25. They were trying to, well, who did this to you? Well, what's his name? And he said, I don't know who he was. All I know is once I was blind, now I can see. The most amazing thing to me is to watch a person see spiritual things. Totally blinded. I was totally blinded to spiritual things. Totally. Man, I was living in my own world, and I thought the whole world lived that way. I went to church on a Sunday morning, and I told Becky, these people are crazy. If, you ever, if I ever get out of this place, I'm not ever coming back. You know why? I was blinded. But just a few weeks later, I got saved. I came back to that same church. Everybody had changed. No, I had changed. I saw. I saw what they were praising about. I understood what they were doing. Not because somebody explained it to me, but because my eyes were opened. Jesus will open your eyes. When you're blinded, you may be blind and say, I just don't see it. How many of you ever said, I just don't see it. I just don't see it. You know what? Say, Jesus, you open the eyes of the blind. Open my eyes where I can see what I need to see. Open my eyes where I see what I need to see. Why? Because he said, I came to restore sight to the blind. Then it goes on to say that I have come. Oh, man, I like this one too. I'm about out of time, but listen to this. He said, I have come to set at liberty those who are oppressed. One of my mentors, Dr. Lester Sumrall, back in the 1980s was in the Philippines, pastoring a great church over there, doing a great work in the Philippines. And, the, and the, the Lord spoke to him and said, I want you to go back to America. He said, because millions of people are going to become oppressed by television. Do you understand how easy it is if you let yourself to become oppressed one step past depressed is oppressed. That means you're held down. Depressed means you can get out of it. Oppressed means you're held down to something. If all you do is listen to what the world's saying and listen to what is going on around the world, it can, it, you will literally become oppressed. Jesus said, I've got good news for you. You can live a happy, joyous life 
a free life because I have come, listen to me, I have come that you may, let me read it to you again. I have come that you might have liberty. The oppressed will have liberty. The word there actually means to be crushed and broken into pieces. Good news for you today. That doesn't happen to happen to you. You don't have to live that way. You don't ever have to live like that. Now, I'm just about finished, but I want you to listen to this, okay? Here's what you need to know about Jesus' ministry to you. He will look past all of your obvious inconsistencies in life to meet you where you are. You think about the woman who was caught in the act of adultery in the Word of God. Did you know that Jesus did not blast her, beat her down, talk about how bad she was, how ugly she was? You know what he did? He said, where are your accusers? Well, they were all gone. She, and Jesus looked at her and said, I don't accuse you either. Now, this woman literally had been committing adultery. But bottom line, Jesus said, I don't accuse you. I don't accuse you. He didn't deal with her, her life situation first. He set her free first. But you know what? Now, listen, this is very important. Because then Jesus said something else. Don't do it anymore. He corrected her, but that was not the first. He didn't walk up there and say, don't do that anymore now. You know, I ran off all these accusers, but don't you dare do that anymore. You know what he said? I don't accuse you either. I'm not judging you. Just don't do it anymore. You know it's not good. I know it's not good. Don't do it anymore. Wherever you are in your life, your life inconsistencies do not change Jesus' desire to minister to you and to bless you in your life. Don't get trapped in the deception, listen to this, that he first has to deal with your spiritual problem to meet your physical needs or to meet other needs in your life. I've actually had people, and I've talked to them about the Lord, and they've got deep personal issues in their life. And you know what they told me? Well, the Lord's too busy. Are you kidding me? He lives for this. He lives to look past your inconsistencies. He, lo- he lives to look past even your, your spiritual flaws to touch you physically. To help you. To break the yoke of, of bondage in your life. To release you. And then he'll say, now let's talk. But you have to understand how he deals with you. He doesn't ignore your spiritual problem. Don't misunderstand that. He has the capacity to separate the issues. And he'll lead you down the greatest, most wonderful path of life you've ever imagined if you'll just let him. You don't have to talk him into it. All you've got to do is let him. Well, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know what he did for you. It doesn't matter. There was a woman who came to Jesus. Listen to me. A woman who came to Jesus. She, we would have called her probably today a Hindu. Because she had all kinds of God. She was a Canaanite woman. Her daughter was sick. Needed help. Jesus said, I've only come to minister to this group. And the woman wouldn't leave him. She came and fell down and worshipped him. And you know what? Jesus healed her daughter. Didn't even believe in the Messiah. Didn't even believe in God the way that Jesus was expressing God. But yet Jesus said, your faith has healed your daughter. Don't ever think you're so far gone or so far away or missing God so bad that, hey, there's no way he'd, he'd, he'd do that for me. There's a way. There's always a way. He wants to minister to you. He, he wrote this so you would know that He would do that in your life. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Word of Life Center podcast. You can connect with us on Facebook and Twitter or at our website, wordoflifecenter.org.